Welcome to episode 30 of Published. Today I'll speak with James Adams, founder of audiobook producer B Audio, about the role of audiobooks in the publishing industry and what authors can expect when creating their own audiobooks. Welcome to Published, a podcast by Greenleaf Book Group, where we'll discuss the ins and outs of the publishing industry, from writing a book and finding the right publisher, to gearing up for a book launch. And now, here's your host, Greenleaf Book Group CEO, Tanya Hall. Welcome back to Published. In today's episode, we're exploring the rising demand for audiobooks in the publishing industry and the process for authors to turn their books into audiobooks. Audiobooks have definitely been a bright spot in the publishing business for years now with really strong year-over-year growth, in part because it's easy to access them. Advancements in technology like content subscription services, smart speakers, and even the standard smartphone can help readers download audiobooks in seconds to listen to them while they're at at the gym, cleaning the house, or commuting to work. So for authors looking for a wider audience, it's very important to meet readers or listeners where they are and give them the content in a format that they want to consume it in. The consumer side of the industry is straightforward enough, but there's a lot that goes into the creation of any audiobook. And here to help explain the process is James Adams, the founder of audiobook producer B Audio. James has an extensive background in journalism and cyber intelligence, of all things, has written over a dozen in fiction and nonfiction books and has narrated or narrated as he says around 175 audiobooks a bit productive this gentleman let's get into the interview okay James can you tell us about your journey to found B audio and the services that your team provides sure um, sometime in the last uh, 10 or 12 years uh, a, uh, a member of our community who was uh, a mother of a, a person their daughter was in Pony Club along with my daughter, and she uh, suggested that I become a narrator because, as you can hear, I have a peculiar accent. And um, (laughs) I I didn't know anything about narration, so there's another company here in town uh, that does audiobooks, and I went to uh, try out for them, and they gave me a book that day, and I kind of started narrating and I, I've always loved books and I've written a few and so on so it was a very good fit and but at the same time I'm also a sort of tech technology guy and and I it all seemed very inefficient and extremely expensive to me so I saw an opportunity to um, take the existing business and transform it so I uh, I raised some money and and uh, tried to buy it and uh, didn't succeed for various reasons. So I then thought, okay, well, with a clean sheet of paper, what would I do? And um, at that time, uh, audiobook production was costing around $1,200 to $1,500 a finished hour and took forever. And you'd go into a studio as a narrator and there'd be a director and a producer and an engineer and all this team of people. And I figured that was very much locked in the previous century. So I looked at what could be done differently and set up what is now a pretty standard procedure for much of the industry, which was creating a virtual organization uh, which would allow narrators to work at home using uh, decent software and uh, decent technology. And uh, that cut the costs from um well over a thousand dollars to around uh well less than four hundred dollars anyway so it was a reduction of about two-thirds and uh that then acted as a forcing function for the rest of the industry and uh everybody now operates something very similar so so now we do we work for most of the major um audiobook production people, uh, publishers and so on, as well as individuals, uh, providing a, a full service because it's uh, there are skills associated with it, even though there are there is lots of, of software. So you have you as uh, if you're wanting to create an audiobook, you would come to us, we would identify an appropriate narrator run that by you do you like the sound do you think that'll reflect what you want as a as an author or a publisher um we then 
get that script, we give it to the narrator, and at the same time, we stand up a, a virtual team of narrator, proofer, uh, engineer, editor, and quality control person. And those that group all communicate through uh, some web-based software. And narrator goes off, does his or her thing, uploads the product. It's checked by the proofer against the manuscript. Are there any mistakes? Is there is the pronunciation wrong? Uh, are you continuing to identify your voice with the right characters and so on? And all those corrections are uploaded by the proofer. The proofer then, uh, the narrator downloads those, does all the corrections. The engineer knits it all together. Quality control makes sure that everybody's done their job properly. And off it goes. So it's a pretty efficient, uh, very well-defined process over hundreds, maybe thousands of audiobooks now. Well, congratulations. It sounds like you were one of the trailblazers then in terms of making this a much more efficient process for the industry, which I imagine helped to support its growth. Yes, I, th- I think that that's true. And I, I think, too, though, that, that um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a journey and it's a work in progress is the right way to put it, because I think like all uh, technology driven changes or revolutions or transformations or whatever, they're only a way station on the road because you're always looking for what would be the next thing. And the important thing for me was at at that time was um, as an author myself, it seemed to me that that publishers in, in the traditional sense were very much stuck in a in a world that is is moved on. And so how to, um, I mean, democratizing is, is probably over, over egging the cake, but um, how to make publishing accessible to everybody. So all aspiring authors should not be constrained by having to get a literary agent and uh, sell to one of the traditional New York publishers, but instead they should be able to publish their work uh, in any form they want, um, pretty inexpensively. And that seems to have happened. And so you, you'll see today that there are uh, different levels now. You've got the, the, the author who does everything him or herself. Then you have uh, ebook publishers who facilitate that process and uh, charge a percentage or a modest fee or whatever. And then you have the traditional publishers. And the the first two of those are far in in the majority in in the uh, number of books that are published each year, and and I think that's a that's a really great thing because we as consumers should all have access to as much or as little as we want whenever we want it at a price we can afford. But all that said, I don't think we are. I, I still think there is still too much of a. Uh, monopolistic environment or a, or a protectionist environment. So why is it, for example, that I might pay $20 or $22 or something for a hardback book and I will pay the same price, roughly speaking, for an audio book? Well, that doesn't make any sense to me at all. The, audio, the cost of, of uh, creation of, of an audio book is a fraction of the cost of uh, making a hardback book. And so therefore, it would be logical that the, the cost of an audiobook would be a, a, equally a fraction of the, of the cost of a, of a hardback book. Well, the, the reason that's not true is that Amazon have a, have a very uh, strong presence in the market and, uh, and, it, and it's very hard to compete with Amazon. So I don't, th- history says that that all economics hates a monopoly and, and no monopolies last the test of the market. So I, I think that will change and we'll see a lot of developments on the pricing front in the in the not too distant future. And of course, the, the technology changes that are coming down the pike are absolutely extraordinary. And I think will will also impact the cost of the creation of an audio book, which I think will will tumble once again to maybe two thirds of what it is today um, because of some technology stuff that's coming down. So it's going to be a very interesting 
next few years. Mm -hmm. I totally agree with your comments there. And I will add to that, that from the publisher's viewpoint or in in some of our listeners' cases, if they're self-publishing using a platform where they handle this on their own, uh, exacerbating that issue with retail price that you described is the fact that the royalties are absolutely dismal, uh, especially when considering the expense and that there's no real delivery cost for the digital product to go out the door. So hopefully there is some pressure on that as competitors start to move in on Amazon's stronghold there. Yeah, I hope so. And, I, and, and it doesn't seem... It just doesn't seem equitable to me that that uh, that the profits that that some of these um, that Amazon and others are making are, are way out of line with uh, the cost of production and out of line with the creative effort that goes into um, creating the, the the literary product in it in the first place. I mean, it takes me. If I'm writing a book, it takes me, I don't know, a year to do the research, six months to write it or something like that, uh, which which is, even if you break it down by by a miserable price per hour, is, is, is a huge investment. And yet, uh, when you take into account what it costs a... Uh, a video, um, an audiobook publisher to to produce the product, it, it takes them no time at all and costs almost nothing. So th- there's a big imbalance there. And, and I, I have a great faith in the market. And I think the market tends to even these things out, even though there is an opportunity to make out like a bandit at the beginning, uh, it tends to sort itself out. And companies like Greenleaf are doing a great job in in coming into the market and showing a different way of doing business, which uh, I think is is long overdue and very welcome. Well, thank you for those kind words. I appreciate that. And we're happy to fit that spot in the industry, of course. Um, I guess let's move into some of the questions I think our listeners may be asking themselves about the actual maybe uh, trends that you might see within audiobooks. I know that there's been tremendous year-over-year growth. It's certainly, as I mentioned in the introduction, a bright spot in the publishing industry. But can you, for our listeners' sake, maybe give us the highlights of how this boom in audiobooks has impacted our industry? Well, I think um, I think a couple of things. The, the fir- first is, is the sort of present, which is uh, you've seen a lot of new entrants into the market that have uh, spotted an opportunity. So th- there are companies like Greenleaf that, that are establishing or have established a significant uh, customer base and will continue to grow. The second is uh, the venture capital or investment community have stepped in and seen an opportunity for consolidation across the industry where you've got inefficiencies, you've got a a duplication of effort and so on. And so there's been a lot of uh, mergers and acquisitions taking place that uh, are, on the one hand, putting different groups together, but on the other, uh, reducing competition, which is unfortunate. But set against that, the industry as a whole remains, I think, pretty inefficient. Uh, there are opportunities to have more cost savings. Uh, why do audiobook producers operate with bricks and mortar uh, buildings? Why are the people on salaries? Uh, all, all of that kind of thing is uh, are, are legitimate questions, and they don't, they shouldn't really hold good anymore in a highly competitive environment. I mean, at B Audio, there are maybe. 400 people or so, uh, one way or another, uh, engaged in different aspects of production. Uh, there are no salaries, uh, including myself. Uh, nobody gets paid a, a, a salary, and nor should they, because we want to reduce the cost to the absolute lowest possible level, because that way we remain competitive. And I and I think the industry as a whole has not necessarily moved to uh, reflect that. And so there is still more room to maneuver. And the consolidation in the industry uh, is, of course, a a justification for the status quo. It's not a justification for radical change. And and I I think, especially as we are in a technology revolution, 
radical change is the nature of the day. And if you can't change, then you should just get out of the business and go and do something else. But I think, too, though, looking forward from the from the present to the near future, I think we're going to see some very interesting changes. Because if you look at how the cost structure of the of the creation of an audiobook works, the narrator is easily and far and away the most expensive piece of that puzzle. Uh, and then you you have the en- engineers and the editors and, and proofers and whatnot, and they're they're all kind of down at at a sm- small fraction of what a narrator gets. And the narrator's job is a very skilled one. It's interpreting, it's accents, it's it's having a smooth and accessible delivery and so on. But think about that for a minute and think too about what you've experienced with um, Alexa or Siri and how those have changed significantly in the last three to five years. We're moving to a place where artificial intelligence will be able to allow multiple devices to have similar, uh, very complex conversations. And if you think about uh, what an accent is or what an interpretation of an emotional connection is, it, it's actually ones and zeros, and and they can be defined. So if you have a, a large enough database uh, of multiple voices, you're going to be able to say, uh, you're able to get, going to be able to match a, a voice against a text, and that voice could be uh, mine, say, my particular accent and way of, of speaking and whatnot. And you can ascribe an algorithm to, to my voice. And my voice could be replicated. So instead of, and in fact, you can already do this in, in what's called deep fake, which is the creation of video or, or voice intercepts or whatever you want, really, you can create something that is absolutely indistinguishable from the real thing. So just put that into audiobooks for a second. So let's say rather than than my gating item as a narrator is I only have so many hours in the day. I can do maybe a book every week or two weeks or whatever, depending on how much time I have available. Well, how about if my voice can be an algorithm and my voice can be licensed not for the 200 or 300 dollars a finished hour which is what uh, narrators charge or really good narrators a lot more than that but instead you you license it for five dollars a finished hour say and instead of producing one book every week or two you can produce 50 books every week or two because it's a an algorithmic problem it's not a it's not a, a how many hours in the day other so i think we could see as artificial intelligence becomes more mainstream you could see a a, a shift in how audiobooks are created uh, on the one hand you you have the algorithms that can uh, that can replicate a, a really good narrator's voice with all the emotional connection that the listener wants. And then you can have, on the other, uh, a different cost basis. So uh, so if, if, let's say, the narrator is $300 a finished hour, the engineer is uh, $25, $30 a finished hour, the proofer is the same kind of a area, well, then, if you're looking at a narrator being $5 a finished hour, proofer and engineer the same sort of numbers, uh, in fact, you'd probably pay the proofer a bit more because they'd be manipulating the algorithms as opposed to doing the, the current way of correcting the audio file. And then you'll see then that, that if you add up all those numbers, you'll see how audiobooks can be done for a small fraction of what they are at the moment. Uh, so uh, the, another phase of the revolution will unfold that will transform the business model of every single business, um, company operating in the space and again will be a forcing function to allow authors uh, who previously would not able, be able to afford an audiobook 
but would now be able to to market their work through audio uh, as a preferred option above and beyond what they can do with text. So, you know, it's a, it's going to be a very interesting uh, time, I think. Yeah, you're right. There's some exciting developments on the horizon for sure, and I look forward to seeing those unfold. So moving back over to the market a bit, um, can you talk to us a bit about how sales play out in the audiobook field, if this is a topic uh, that you're comfortable with in terms of, let's say, fiction versus nonfiction? Is it pretty even, or is there one genre that kind of runs away with audiobook sales? I I, do, I think that's a that's something of a piece of string question because it's so dependent on um, what the actual product is, what the uh, what the investment that has been made in the audio. Some audio is is really awful and uh, has not been doesn't have proper quality control. There isn't a narrator who understands how to communicate properly and and so on. So. Typically, you you could say that um, fiction does really well across wide genres, but at the same time, business books historically uh, have done extremely well in nonfiction, as has good biography, um, good uh, books that are kind of uh, about personal growth and that kind of thing. So it, it it's it's very hard to break it out in a way that um, if I were starting off in the business and I uh, as an author um, would I advise myself to focus on fiction or nonfiction or the, um, biography or whatever and I I just don't think that's it's all about the quality and. That too is something of a of a lottery because you you just don't know until you until you know that this is going to ring the bell and most books the vast majority of books don't sell very many now today that it used to be that 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 was you were dependent upon a publisher doing a proper marketing job. Uh, and in my experience, having written 18 books or something, that was a complete lottery. And sometimes I'd be on the Today Show, and sometimes I would be getting one radio interview with somewhere that no one had ever heard of in the middle of Iowa. And all of my books were published by the best publishers. So it, it was very uncertain. And one of the the transformations that has occurred um, is the ability of the author to directly influence how well the book does. And so uh, the, the, I, I did a book that came out in, in um, December that on artificial intelligence that was, uh, that I, because it's a, such a fast moving environment, I, I uh, did it as an ebook. And uh, that, uh, how that did was dependent not on, uh, of course, the brilliance of the writing, the master stroke <laughs> of, of choice of subject, but uh, how good was my Facebook site? How good is my social media? My, uh, how often do I tweet? Uh, how much am I willing to invest in ads on Facebook? Um, and so it's a... Uh, it's a multiple it, it's a multiple numbers of outlets and how each of those fit together and how sophisticated that marketing is now there's, there's tons of people who do that for a living of course and who are far more effective than I would be but it, it's it's no longer just I've written a book I'm going to leave it to somebody else I think it's much more uh, my book is going to be great and how it's going to be great investment I make in the marketing of it as opposed to being passive in in the environment and then you can say in answer to your question my biography is going to sell better than so-and-so's piece of war fiction because i'm doing a really good job of marketing it and that's going to be the discriminator And, and and i think there's a reluctance often among authors of all at all levels, whether you're a CEO or a first time out the gate author, 
to recognize that degree of responsibility. It's just, it's just hard because writing a book is not, you know, most authors are introverts and they sit in their garret pounding away at the keys and, uh, and they don't want to do the, all the extrovert stuff. But I think that's, that's very much a, a part of the whole uh, the whole ball of wax these days, and you've got to think about it like that. Yeah, I completely agree. It's a point that we just can't stress enough, the role that the author plays in promoting their book um, through their through many means, whether it's their actual marketing efforts or stuff like we're talking about today and supporting different formats. So let's move on to the million-dollar question, uh, one that we <laughs> come up against with our authors quite often. Can you speak to us about when it might be appropriate if it is at any time appropriate for an author to narrate their own audiobook? And what are the considerations they might not be thinking about when they jump in feet first and say, yes, I'm going to read it? Well, that is a difficult question. Um, my, our experience is that most authors are not uh, the best people to narrate a, uh, their own book. Uh, there are a couple of reasons. One, um, very few authors have the experience of um, speaking um, either in public or in, in, into a microphone. And it, it, it is a skill. It's like any other skill. It's like learning how to weld or, uh, ch- or, or be a draftsman or something. I mean, it, it, it is a skill that uh, requires honing and teaching and all of that. There are very, very few people who can sit down in front of a microphone and nail it, really very few. And the problem with, um, I mean, you could come to us and you could say, uh, here we are, I I want to, and and some authors do this, and I want to narrate and I'm set up, I can go down to this studio down the road and uh, and there's uh, somebody who can help me do that. And we'll give them some honest feedback. Um, there's the egotistical satisfaction of I've just narrated my own audiobook, but does that give you actually what you want, which is sales and recognition of of a great book being given uh, exactly the right treatment? And uh, I would caution: um, you save a lot of money, of course, but do you, in the long run, serve yourself? And I would caution most authors against doing their own uh, audio. And and it, I mean, from my perspective, it matters from a business perspective. It matters to me not a bit um, because we still do the same work behind the scenes to, uh, you know, proof it, edit it, all that stuff, and to make it as as good as it can possibly be. But the professional narrator. Uh, I mean, they tend to be just really good, and some of them been doing it all their working life, and you over hundreds of books, and and that is a a professional skill that is hard won, and it is the difference between uh, the amateur and the pro, and uh, so I would always seek, or I would always advise somebody to to get the best they can get. And you don't need to spend, um, you know, a, a really good narrator, I suppose, is $500 a, a finished hour or more. Um, well, I, we don't pay anybody that kind of money. Um, and I, I, don't, I, I don't think you need to spend a fortune to get something really good. And I would encourage all authors to do that. But if you think you've got the, the chops, then give it a whirl. I mean, there's nothing lost in trying after all. Agreed. Although I think some people may underestimate the time commitment that goes into this because you realistically can't walk into the studio and read for eight hours straight unless you've got some super endurance voice. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, the typical one rule of thumb is, is, is a ratio of three to one. So, um, for every finished hour you have, you're probably doing three hours sitting in the studio going over the same sentence two or three times or whatever it is. Um, so if you've got a, say an average book is 10 hour, ten finished hours, then you've got 30 hours of, of audio 
And again, if you think about that in timing terms, that's two weeks, three weeks perhaps, because your your voice won't be able to stand it too much, especially if you're not used to it. So it's it's quite an undertaking and quite a commitment. And most authors have a day job, so you're asking yourself, uh, I as an author, I'm asking myself to commit to this amount of time over, uh, you know, this this time commitment over this period uh, to deliver the book, whereas you can hand it off to somebody and be pretty confident it'll be completed in the uh, the time that's been agreed and, uh, and just let them get on with it. Yeah, thank you. And James, do you have any parting advice for authors who would like to turn their books into an audio book, perhaps? Well, I, I, I'm a believer, and I, uh, I, as I was saying a little bit earlier, I think that every book these days needs to be uh, print on demand, a um, an ebook, so print on demand book. It needs to be a a, a digital book, so downloaded to a, a Kindle or or an iPad or whatever, and it needs to be an audio book because the each product is um, has to be cross marketed. So if you're going to take an ad on Facebook, say, uh, you want to give uh, just like the publishing world itself has created choice for authors. So the consumer market for individuals like me who read a lot of books and, and love books, I, I want to be able to uh, I want to be able to read it, listen to it in the car if, I, if that's my choice. I want to be able to read it in bed on my iPad or my Kindle if that's my choice, or I want to be curled up in an armchair reading uh, uh, a, 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 an actual physical book. And I want that choice. That's my right as a consumer. So as an author, I think authors need to be thinking about their world in exactly the same way, not restricting how their customers, how their consumers, how their clients, how their readers get to them, but offer them any any way they can get to it, here it is, you can have it. And then it makes marketing easier because you, for every buck you spend on marketing, you're, you're actually marketing to three different verticals, not just one. And, and therefore, you're getting a better bang for your buck. So I would always go for audio. Um, I mean, just a, a small anecdote. I was in, um, I was in uh, L.A. I've, I've done a script with a guy for a TV series, on a uh, uh, fictional TV series. And I, and I um, was in their, the office of this production company. And I walked in and... The, and uh, the guy, one of the guys said, uh, oh, it's, it's so great to be able to put a, a, a face to the voice. Uh, I said, oh, what do you mean by that? He said, well, I, I downloaded your, your book and I was listening to it over the weekend because I knew we were going to get together as I was driving to and from somewhere or other. And that was a perfect illustration of why it makes sense to provide the opportunity to anyone who wants to acquire an author's product, get it in any format they want, whenever they want it. And that's, we can do that. We as authors can do that. And that, and that's terrific. And there are enough ways now to create that audiobook that it should be affordable and you should be able to hire the right skills to get the right job done. Yes, thank you. That was sage parting advice. And thank you so much for joining us on the podcast today. I learned a lot about audiobook production and the market itself, and I'm sure our listeners have as well. So I appreciate your time. Thank you. That's it for our episode today. We hope you learned something new and are better equipped to turn your book into an audiobook. For notes and resources from today's show, go to greenleafbookgroup.com slash episode 30. You can also find advice for writing, publishing, and promoting your work in my book, Ideas, Influence, and Income, which you can learn more about at ideasinfluenceandincome.com. If you've enjoyed our show, kindly rate and review us on iTunes. It sure means a lot to have your feedback and helps us to make sure we're answering your publishing questions. Special thanks to Claire Yench for producing this episode and frankly, almost all of the other episodes of Published. Sorry for the late credit. We'll be back next month with more from Published. Thanks for listening to Published. To learn more, please visit greenleafbookgroup.com. 
and remember to subscribe to this podcast on iTunes.